The following is a program of the Santa Barbara County Education Office. To learn more, visit sbceo.org. Hi, I'm Susan Salcedo, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools, and I am so delighted to introduce my guest today, Robin Elak, Social Studies teacher at Kermit McKenzie Intermediate School in the Guadalupe Union School District. Robin, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to talk <laughs> ta to share about you and have you talk about your experiences. I'd like to let the audience know that a uh, social studies teacher is just one part of a big part of your day, each day in Guadalupe. Um, you're also the AVID director for the district. AVID is Advancement via Individual Determination. Determination. And also you were recently recognized as um, one of three distinguished mentor teachers in Santa Barbara County. So congratulations Thank for you. that. Yeah, Thank very you. excited to talk <laughs> about all of those different aspects of your, um, your day. But I'd like to start really way back in terms of childhood, you're growing up, um, you're a Santa Maria Valley gal. And so let's talk about um, your childhood, your schools that you attended, family. Um, I say I'm born and raised, even though I was born in Paso Robles. Okay. My uh, parents divorced when I was a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And so we moved back home after that. Um, so I attended schools all, th all throughout my years here. Um, I went to Adam Elementary, where my mom still works. She's the school librarian. Um, at El Camino Junior High, and I graduated from Santa Maria High School. Fantastic. And did you did you go to college right after graduating? I did. Okay. I went straight to Cal State Long Beach and quickly realized it was not the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. uh, being one of 40,000 students was overwhelming to me. Mm -hmm. And so I made the decision to switch schools in the middle of my freshman year, and I got accepted to Azusa Pacific University. Um, There's a family that I grew up with that I call my brothers, and two of them were attending and so that was an easy switch for me because now I was with family mm -hmm. and then um, while I was there two more came along the way too so it was a it was a family fit family dynamic and it was a small Christian school and it felt a lot like high school again because it was the small setting and that's what that's where I needed to be that's where I blossomed right and you were talking about um, being homegrown, growing up in Santa Maria Valley, even though you were born in Paso Robles, and it's a part of part of the beauty here is that small town mm -hmm. feel and people knowing people. So, um, your college experience somewhat mirrored your growing up experience. Right, exactly. And how would you describe yourself as a student back in the days where you <laughs> attended Adam El Camino and Santa Maria High? Um, well, in my early years, um, I didn't learn to read until I was in third grade. Okay. Um, uh, I was later diagnosed with having a learning disability. Um, so school in the beginning was very, very hard for me. Um, I have a very vivid memory of being in third grade at the start of the school year. And, um, you know, teachers try to uh, not call attention to uh, different reading groups, but we all kind of figured it out that, you know, I was in like the inchworm group mm -hmm. and the others were in the butterflies or whatever terminology they used. Right. And, and we knew which kids were, what that meant. Um, but I have my third grade teacher who I love completely. She worked with me and got me back up to where I needed to be. And so I give her the credit for being a reader. That's incredible. Um, because she saw something in me and worked with me and helped me overcome whatever my challenges were. And you had learned at that time, I think, that the learning disability hindered in terms of reading, but mm -hmm. also mathematics, mathematics right? Mathematics, yeah. Yeah, so both. So te technically, I didn't find out that I had my, I mean, I always knew that there was something. And my mom always knew that there was something. And so she would, you know, my mom would work with me and she'd advocate that teachers work a little bit differently with me. Um, but it wasn't until um, college, my freshman year in college, when I was at Long Beach, um, I was in a small writing seminar course and my professor had me um, read out loud something I had just written. Mm -hmm. And he had in front of him the copy of what I had written and the way I read it was different. And so he saw the disconnect. And so he, he just point blank asked me, do you have dyslexia? And it was like, 
is for some people that might be like, what? Mm -hmm. But for me, I was like, oh, yes, I think I do, but I've never been tested. And so he's like, well, let's go find the office where you can find out to get tested. And so he walked me to that, that office on campus and I got tested. And when once I had the label mm -hmm. that this is what it was, it was dys dyslexia and dyscalculia, then it just clicked like that's why I didn't understand these concepts previously mm -hmm. and why I struggled with different things. And I remember going back and talking to my teachers when I would come home on vacation from college and I explained to them, by the way, I have this. And they're like, no, oh, no wonder it, it never clicked. And so I love that you're sharing that. Really appreciate that you're sharing that with myself and the audience today and the viewers today. Because um, for you, it really wasn't, I'll use your terminology, labeled until you were a freshman in college. Um, so probably around 18 or mm -hmm. so. And yet you'd had to kind of work with that right. throughout your whole elementary, junior high, and high school years, which must have been really yeah. challenging. So I appreciate that because if someone's watching today, they might be able to identify themselves or their children or neighbors or yeah. friends that um, are feeling the same way. And growing up, I know I personally in my head labeled myself, you know, I had a lot of doubt mm -hmm. in, in my capabilities and I labeled myself, I was quick to label myself before others would. And mm -hmm. so, you know, um, I've had the opportunity to share that story that I felt like I labeled myself dumb and stupid because I didn't want others to label me that. And right. so it was easier for me to accept the, the label mm -hmm. that I was giving myself. Yeah. Um, but because I, once I had that, it was like, no, I'm not, it's this, and I can work around this, and I can g grow from it, so. So great to share. Thank you so much, Robin, and I love that. I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure it's impacted you as a teacher mm -hmm. for, for 18 for sure. years of having students go through your classroom, and you can help help them identify. Right. And it's one of the are. things I share with my students mm -hmm. at the beginning of each school year mm -hmm. when I'm trying to build that relationship with my students. I share that with them so that they know this is who I am. If I make a mistake writing the writing a word on the board, hey, let me know mm -hmm. and we'll fix it, but I might not see it and it's okay to make mistakes. So that's, that's where you great. grow from. You were talking a moment ago about storytelling, sharing your story. You share this story with your students at the beginning of the year. Um, earlier, I described you as a social studies teacher, but also the district director for AVID, Advancement Via Individual um, Determination. And AVID has institutes each summer, they, have, they hold big uh, professional development opportunities for teachers, and they always have inspirational speakers, students, teachers at all different levels. So I understand that you delivered a very motivational, inspirational speech at the AVID Institute this past summer. And for myself and everybody watching, can you give us a synopsis of the message that you delivered this summer? Yeah, so I had the opportunity to share my AVID, my AVID journey and, and why I feel so passionately in this program. Um, and so I shared kind of, um, I felt like my story was a little bit different. A lot of AVID summer institutes I've been to before, they, the teacher will speak about um, how teaching the AVID elective or something will, will impact them. My journey was a little different because I haven't taught the AVID elective, um, but I've used the AVID strategies and to change the way I teach and the way I connect to my students. And so I was able to share how um, before AVID, I, a lot of those self-doubts and shame that I had had at previous were creeping back in, thinking I'm not a good teacher, I don't know what I'm doing, but with AVID, it helped me overcome those self-doubts. It gave me the tools to be a successful teacher. That's great. And so that's why I felt so passionate to share that story. Thank you for sharing that today again. And not everyone knows what AVID even is. And we, I just described what AVID stands for, but what is AVID in terms of yeah. a program or a system or a, an approach yeah. in terms of teaching and so learning? So AVID, um, AVID originally started in San Diego in the early 80s, and it is a nonprofit organization. It's kind of bloomed out of one teacher's classroom to uh, nationwide, actually international. It's also in Australia. Um, and it's, it is a program that is designed to prepare all students for college and career readiness in a global society. And um, we take that mission really seriously and we focus on all means all. Mm -hmm. You know, all students deserve this, that none of us can be gatekeepers. We can't pick and choose who gets to be college and career ready. We need to provide those strategies and systems of support for all students. And we really focus um, on four big domains, instruction, systems, culture, and leadership. 
That's great. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. And again, for sharing your speech and the synopsis there. Um, talking about college and career readiness, I understand you are um, your family's first college goer in terms of a first generation college mm -hmm. uh, attendee and that you had a very unique way of fundraising <laughs> um, to support some of that tuition. I would love it if you would share that sure. story. <laughs> so because I um, am from Santa Maria, um, one of the big fundraisers that's in this community is the Elks Queen contest mm -hmm. and so one of the things I had the opportunity to do when I was in college was to run for a rodeo queen. and. Um, it's, it's a six-week fundraiser, mm -hmm. and it's a challenge because the winner, win, the winner becomes the queen by selling the most tickets. Mm -hmm. um, I did not become queen, but I worked really hard during those six weeks, and um, as a result, I earned quite a bit of scholarship money, and that helped fund um, my third year in college. So. That's that's a great yes. story. Thank you for sharing that. I think I recall seeing a poster where yes. you were rodeo princess. So um, we'll, we'll have to dig that up and, and show it to the to the viewers. Robin, when did you know you'd wanted to be a teacher? Um, and not actually until college. Okay. And so um, I decided to become a teacher and pursue um, a social science credential um, when I was sitting in a classroom with a particular teacher. Um, her name is Dr. Newstad. And she, for whatever reason, just the way she communicated with her students, the way she shared her knowledge with the students, it just, I saw something in her that I thought I have, I have the ability to do that too. And so she's the one who kind of inspired me to become um, a teacher. I took five courses with her in college, so wow. I really liked her a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and was your first teaching assignment in Guadalupe? Um, no, um, I did six months at Mesa Middle School in Aurora Grande. Um, as a classroom reduction teacher before being hired in Guadalupe. So you've been in Guadalupe for 18 years, mm -hmm. all at McKenzie, I mm -hmm. believe. Um, I know you love it. You, it shows when you're in your classroom, when you talk about it, you talk about teaching and your students. What Describe to us what you love about teaching at McKenzie. Um, it's my family, and so family means a lot to me. Um, I. Um, because I grew up in this community and I feel very passionate about um, paying it forward that um, I felt like a strong connection when I walked into that on, onto that school campus the very first time I automatically felt a connection that this is where I was meant to be and um, even though I've pursued higher education I've pursued my admin credential I haven't felt called to step away yet um, because they're my family and I feel like I have more work to do with them still and there's a particular draw for you for junior high age students, uh, eighth grade, not everybody would select <laughs> teaching for intermediate or junior high, in this case, eighth grade. What do you love about the junior high school age? Oh, they're, <laughs> um, junior high kids are they're, they're very unique unto themselves. Um, they're becoming adults and they're starting to um, challenge society and and ask a lot of questions, but they're not really sure the direction that they need to go in. And so I feel like that's kind of my role sometimes is just to help facilitate that growth. Um, I also I, I talk a lot about how I feel um, I'm happy to plant some seeds in them so that that will take bloom someplace else. And so sometimes that's a little bit of the sadness is that I know we're planting a bunch into them now mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily see the direct result, but I. Um, that's, guys, I guess, the joy of Facebook is I see some of my former students and see what they've gone on to do. So, well, the impact is is major in terms of what you what you do in terms of planting seeds. So we in education appreciate you, Robin, so much. Um, if we were to visit your classroom, what what might we see? Um, well, uh, we'd see a lot of college banners and a lot of emphasis on going to college, and um, I share. I, you know, I have displays on that. I also have displays on who I am as a person, mm -hmm. and I want my kids to know me. You know, I have pictures of my family and pictures of my, you know, former students and stuff like that. Because I want to see, I want my kid, my current kids, kids to see these connections that I've made. Um, I also have map, a map up of all the places I've been to in the world because I think that's really important to encourage that with my students mm -hmm. that you need to step out of your own community and go visit other places from what you gain out of that experience of traveling. And I talk to my kids about places I've been to and share that with them and, and how I have to save money mm -hmm. to do that. And so mm -hmm. it's, it, it does cost money, but you, if you save and you're smart with your money, you can travel the world too. And um, 
that was that's the visual stuff you'd see if you saw what the students were doing because it's social studies there's a lot of social activity going on um, I have them sitting in in groups of three and so there's a lot of team building turn to your table mates talk pair share kind of activities and so um, sometimes it's a noisy classroom but I think in that noise you hear the the conversations and they're deep meaningful conversations so they're really learning through being social and engaging Correct. and asking questions and talking and listening, but they're also learning from their environment, the classroom you set up, the college banners, um, and the inspiration of knowing you as a person and your values in terms of your family, but also the experiences. What do you think um, is so valuable in terms of travel for students and for individuals? I just think you see the world in a different point of view. Mm -hmm. And so being having an open mindset to that there's a lot of different ways to experience life. And so I think that's what travel provides people is you kind of get stuck in your own little bubble. And so it's good to step out of that bubble and see life from a different point of view. And so I encourage that with my students. That's great. Earlier in this segment, I introduced you in multiple ways. And one other way I said uh, who you are as I said, you're one of three distinguished mentors in Santa Barbara County. Tell us how you learned that you <laughs> were selected and one of the three in Santa Barbara County, and we'll be celebrating you at a salute to teachers this fall. Well, this is kind of funny. Um, the email came to me on the very first day of school. So on our first day of school, we have a minimum day uh -huh. because we also have back to school night that night. So I had... I was very tired after the first day of school, so I went home and I told my, my younger son, wake me up in 20 minutes. <laughs> so I went upstairs and I took a nap and he came upstairs, mom, it's time to get up. I was like, all right. So I grabbed my cell phone and I looked at my phone to see if I had any missed messages, checked my email before getting up to go back to work, and there was the email. And I was like, all right, am I reading this right? I had to you know, <laughs> check my eyes. and pull it out. Yep, that was right. So it was a very nice way to celebrate the first day of school. That's exciting. Yeah. That's really exciting. I, I'm, I'm smiling widely about the recognition for sure. And I'm smiling widely because of the day that it was on mm -hmm. in terms of the first day and a minimum day and a back to school. But I'm also kind of giggling about the 20 minute nap because <laughs> I think people who are watching completely understand mm -hmm. wanting just 20 minutes, minutes. yeah, <laughs> to get a little refresh. So I think we're, we're keeping it real, Robin, for sure. Um, Guadalupe, the, Guadalupe, the district is very special. I know you're at McKenzie, but can you say a word or two about what you think in terms of the special um, special feeling in terms of Guadalupe Union? Well, I've mentioned it before. It's that family connection. Mm -hmm. um, even though we're growing and it's been changing a lot this, this particular year yeah. and, and especially. Mm -hmm. but, in terms um, of uh, numbers? And in buildings? terms of numbers, uh -huh. um, we've, we are now an intermediate school at McKenzie. Right. And so there's just a lot of change happening, mm -hmm. but we still have a very strong connection of staff. Mm -hmm. um, and even though we're two campuses, um, we still know each other quite well because we do a lot as a whole district. So um, there's a lot of activity where we have the opportunity to do blended learning together. Mm -hmm. And so we've just built those, those strong bonds with each other and that family connection is, means a lot to me. And, and there are two schools in Guadalupe Union at this time. And again, back to the recognition, you are being recognized as a mentor teacher. And the county really wanted to um, recognize brand new teachers to the profession, but also mentor teachers too, because mentors can make such a big difference for some of our new teachers. So uh, how long have you been mentoring teachers in Guadalupe, this family? Um, so let's see, um, with the county tip program, the mm -hmm. teacher induction program, I think this is my fourth year as a mentor teacher. Um, and my third or fourth person that I've mentored, I've had a couple where they came in on year two, and so I didn't mm -hmm. do year one with them. Um, I love doing this. Um, I feel like it's a real strong overlap with the work I do with AVID because as the AVID district director, I'm trained to be an instructional coach mm -hmm. and to go in and observe and give feedback to teachers in that way, using, you know, watching them teach AVID strategies and to give them training and support that way. And so I just felt like there was a lot of strong overlap with the work I do with the induction program. And so I've been able to kind of cross my two worlds together. I'm sure new teachers to the profession are so relieved to have you as a mentor, just a calming presence with great experiences and can really share 
you can make it and you'll do it. You'll be, you'll be just fine and give some really great advice. Um, one of the areas that I think that um, is called out as a strength for you is recognizing the need for strong parental support for students. Can you talk about what that means to you and why it's important for you? Um, so I would tie this back to my mom. Mm -hmm. um, I know for sure that I would not be who I am today if it was not for my mom. Um, you know, because my parents divorced when I was so young. And I love my father. My father passed away years ago. But um, in a lot of ways, he was an absentee father, mm -hmm. you know, in physicality-wise, because he lived someplace else. But um, my mom is what made me who I am. She fought very hard for me. She. Um, she did not go on to get her college education. You know, she finished in high school, but she valued that, and she made sure I did all the things necessary throughout my educational journey to make sure that that was an opportunity for me and um, stayed very involved in school throughout my upbringing where, you know, she'd serve on different committees and so forth, PTS, a, PTAs and all the kind of stuff, you know, school site council. So when I saw that as her value, that made it valuable to me too. And so I just kind of mirrored what she was doing for me. So in a lot of ways, she was my very first teacher. Mm, that's wonderful. And inspired, such an inspiring story. And inspires you, it sounds like, to encourage parents of your students to really be involved, no matter what their experiences have been. Right. And um, in what ways would you encourage parents to get involved? I know that you've just mentioned committees, but are there other ways that you really feel are beneficial for students if the parents get involved in such a way? Well, the most important thing I always tell parents is read to their kids. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how, how old they are, too. My, um, my oldest is in seventh grade, and I still will, let's cuddle and read. Mm -hmm. Come on, get in the bed, and let's cuddle. <laughs> Um, and I do that with my one who is in fifth grade. We, he has a book that I, I read a chapter a night to him, too. So it doesn't matter how old your child is, reading to them, I think, is still crucial. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because it also opens up dialogue. You know, there's things that I can read in a book to my fifth and seventh grader now. There's topics that I can discuss with them now because we've read about it in a book. And so we've had that open dialogue with conversation. I think a lot of times I see parents... Um, as their child gets older, they're afraid to have certain conversations, mm -hmm. kind of those taboo, scary conversations, but those are necessary, and I think we ne always need to have those conversations. And so just encouraging parents to talk to your child, even when it feels uncomfortable, continue to have those open lines of communication. Great advice. And, I, um, and your mother, in terms of the support that she provided to you, talk about an advocate, you know, really, really, an, 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 an advocate for somebody who... Um, in your case, um, I'm going to call it, it was a struggle because mm -hmm. of the um, non-identification of the disability that you had at the time, you know, learning right. abilities, um, that it was probably even more important or as important as ever, you know, right. to really be an advocate. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the, the label, the labeling, mm -hmm. because for you, having the label ended up feeling really good, right. like whew, a relief. Mm -hmm. um, how does that experience, in terms of your students, how, how does that relate? Do you encourage students to identify kind of how they are as learners? How, how, how yeah, does that I work? do. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important that kids know themselves um, because if you know yourself, then you know what you need. Mm -hmm. That's what I always tell them. There's a phrase I use with my kids. Um, you know yourself, you know your body, you know what you need. And so you're in control of it. And, you know, I kind of jokingly use this, you know, if you know your pencil's broken, it's your pencil, go, go fix it. Or if you need to blow your nose, it's your nose. Mm -hmm. it's, you're, you're the one who has it. It's mm -hmm. yours. And so we joke about it. But it also comes to what do they need to be a better learner? They, they know themselves. And so just providing them that opportunity to, um, to learn how to advocate for themselves. I'm a, big, I'm a big supporter of making sure kids have the tools they need mm -hmm. to ask questions and not to be scared of going to the teacher and asking for help. That's great. And teaching, Robin, is such a rewarding profession. I mean, it's, it's a challenging one. It's a hard one. I mean, but it's worth all that you put in day in, day out for 18 years. And I'm, I'm sure if I ask you this question, you're going to think of a hundred different examples of really great special highlights. But I'm wondering if there are, as you look back, any particular highlights that were really just remarkable to you in your career so far? Oh, gosh. Um... I think the highlights I see when I think like in, in generic general mm -hmm. terms, I just I can think of um, different times when I'm teaching a lesson and you see the kid just 
like almost like sit up like, oh, they got it. Mm -hmm. And then it's the turn and I'm going to teach this person here because I've got it and now I want to help them get it too. Um, setting up a dynamic that allows that to happen on a regular basis is how I, when I'm backwards planning how I'm going to teach a lesson, mm -hmm. I try to think about how can I build in those aha moments for my kids because that's where I find the most satisfaction in my teaching. That connects to the next question I was going to ask, but maybe I need not ask it, which was what, what do you love? I mean, what are the, you know, the, the, I know there's challenges, but there's just things that it's a calling for us and we just love this about teaching. Would you say the same? Yeah, yeah, I mm -hmm. would. And I also say because I'm a history teacher um, and I love, teach, I love to be able to, um, you know, I, I jokingly laugh that I teach about old white men. Uh -huh. And so making um, cultural connections sometimes is very hard for my students because we're like, oh, this is old white dead men. Mm -hmm. And so trying to find ways that you can make the, the, yes, we're studying about something that happened 200, 300 years ago, but this is why it's meaningful to Nate because, you know, patterns do repeat themselves in history. And so helping them make those connections of, oh, that's why we need to know about this because of this current thing that's happening. Robin, I think it's important for our viewers to know that you know you have multi dimensions. You're a teacher. You've been a teacher for a long time, award winning. Now you've got multiple different hats that you wear in the district. But I also think it's important to share that you're a daughter, you're a mother, you're a wife, and you are busy. <laughs> um, so how do you keep any semblance of balance? Not necessarily in a day, but maybe a week or even a month. How do you unwind and keep some balance? <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, one thing I think that's huge help for me is my husband because he does exactly the same thing I do. So he's a history teacher and he's an avid teacher. And so when we talk shop, it helps to kind of like, all right, we're both kind of dealing with the same thing too. And then um, my boys make me laugh every day. They're just silly and goofy and they definitely are the ones who kind of help ground me. That's wonderful. How old are your boys? Uh, 10 and 12. Okay. Well, that's great. So we can we're doing a little bit of a hello out to your <laughs> yeah. family, which I think are, are they're such important people to you, I know, and talking with you. Um, in closing of our time together, which has gone so fast, I really want to give you an opportunity, Robin, to um, send a message out to the students who I know will be watching. They're so excited to have you on this show, I know. What do you want to say to those students? Oh, wow, that's a deep one. <laughs> um, that even though we challenge them to be um, focused, that we're doing it because we love them. We're not doing it because as some junior high kids, oh, that teacher hates me. Um, we push because we care so much and we see so much potential in them and we want them to go on to do great things. And I never wanna be somebody who um, has closed a door or, or, or closed the gate. I want to make sure that everything I do allows that child to make that decision for themselves when they're at the right point in their life to make that decision. That's a great message to end on today. Thank you, Robin, for sharing your story and um, opening up a, a window into your life and experiences that I think are really meaningful and important for people to hear and understand. And I also want to thank you for um, providing such a great education for our students at McKenzie and Guadalupe. And congratulations once again for um, being recognized as a distinguished mentor in Santa Barbara County, so thank you. Thank you. I'm Susan Salcedo, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools. Thank you so much for joining us today for this edition of Schools of Thought.